I know the enemy may be piling on this morning, but let Jesus, amen, take your load. Let Jesus take that burden. I was looking out across the congregation and I saw some of the, the younger children. They were just saying hallelujah, singing the song, saying hallelujah. It blessed my heart. Amen. And probably they don't know to the fullness of what they're doing, but what they were saying is let God be exalted. Let God be exalted. Every time we shout hallelujah, we're saying let God be exalted. And that will resonate in that life. There's a seed, there's a foundation being built in these young lives. Amen. When we show them Jesus, when we teach them Jesus. Amen. But I, I, just, I just want to encourage you this morning. Amen. You may be facing trouble. You may be facing trial. It's a part of life. It's a part of life that we don't like. And sometimes we handle it better than we do others. But I can tell you Jesus handles it good every time. Jesus never has a weak moment. Jesus never has a situation where he doesn't know what to do. Amen. And so, with that being said, the Lord told us that we could cast our cares and our burdens upon him. And he would give us rest from those very things. I appreciate him so much that Jesus, amen, has completely orchestrated deliverance for every circumstance in our life. No matter what comes our way, no matter what area or what place it comes from, the Lord has made, amen, a place for us to be delivered from it, a place that we can run to, a place that we can hide under the shelter of His wing. Aren't you glad you have Jesus today? Amen. We love Him so much. Amen. Thank you. Just lift up your hands and give the Lord a good praise offering. Just a good spirit. Here in the church this morning, amen, we want to allow the Lord, amen, to do, amen, to lead as He wants to go this morning, amen, we have the message to preach, and, and by and help, by and through the help and grace of the Lord and His anointing, we're going to preach it this morning, amen, but we do want to take time, amen, just to lift our hands to heaven and say thank you, Lord, for this opportunity today, just to be in your presence just to be able to call upon your name to feel the comfort of knowing that you are with us. It makes a difference, folks, knowing that Jesus is with you. It makes a great difference in our life that when we're facing, amen, the, the tauntings of the enemy, amen, that Jesus is that one that's standing behind us. So the enemy's not seeing me. He's seeing my Savior. Amen. Because my Savior is so much greater. Hallelujah. And He cares. Amen. For you and I. Our big brother. Amen. Our keeper. The Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. What a God we serve today. Amen. If you have your Bibles this morning, let's go to the book of John in chapter 14. The book of John in chapter 14. How many of you have been seeing the, the post of our Facebook page? Uh, Jason's been working on that. We appreciate that and putting things out there. And, and we're going to be making enhancements and, and doing things, hopefully to enhance the worship experience. Amen. We're not putting in uh, foggers and strobe lights or nothing like that. Amen. But we're, we're going to do things. Amen. Good Lord willing. Amen. Just to amen, help us in our worship of Jesus Christ. Chapter 14 and verse 15, the book of John. You ready? These are the words attributed to Jesus, the words written in red. If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth. Whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but yet, or but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. Let's drop down to verse 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things 
and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. I want to take my thought today. Well, it's just a, a lot of scripture that I've read to you. It's just a broad thought. But I just want to preach about the Holy Ghost this morning. Amen. That's the best and simplest way I know to tell you. Amen. I feel like I'm going to throw about five or six dishes your way this morning. So I'm just going to put them all under the covering of the Holy Ghost. Okay. Amen. You may be seated this morning. There is a lot of thoughts, a lot of ideas about the working of the Spirit of God. A lot of ideas about the Holy Ghost and how it acts, how it performs its work, and how it completes its mission. I want you to understand that the Holy Ghost has a mission. Just as Jesus had a mission. And you know what Jesus' mission for you and I. Jesus' mission is still relevant today. He is still working. The cross didn't end or the tomb didn't end the mission of Jesus Christ. It just set it ablaze. Okay? It just enhanced it, if you will. But then the Holy Ghost comes at the behest of God because I read it to you that Jesus said, I'll go away, but my Father is going to send you the Holy Ghost. Now, this Holy Ghost is something that has been promised, amen, throughout the Old Testament and is going to come to fruition in just a short time after Jesus is talking here in John chapter 14. But I want to just stop there for a moment and we'll just, as Sister Peter says, we're going to push the pause button there and we're going to go back, amen, and, and do a little backdrop. I want, to be, I want to think about today that how that the Holy Ghost and how this coming to fruition of it was way back and established in the festivals that God ordained for the children of Israel. And we're going to look at two in particular. We're not going to look at all of the feasts today, but we're going to look at two in particular that have a relevant bearing, amen, on what we're talking about today. Today being the uh, day of Pentecost, right? Fifty days after the resurrection, it tells us that it is the day of Pentecost. And so Pentecost just means 50, friend. So we look at this and understand that back in the day that God established different feasts for the children of Israel, and this was feasts that were just established to keep them remembrance in remembrance of the favor of God of the provision of God, how that the Lord met every need that they ever had, even through their grumblings, even through their complainings, their mumblings, and, and their doubt and their idolatry, God was faithful. Doesn't that say a lot about Him that though His chosen were unfaithful, God was still faithful to His chosen? That the Lord, though He, was, he grew uh, frustrated and angry in His his wrath was kindled, as the Old Testament would say. It, it, it just simply says that God would mete out punishment to them, but He would always cover them in mercy after the punishment was meted out. What are you saying, preacher? He always reassured them that He loved them, that they drew the punishment upon themselves, but His love never changed for them. His love never waned for them, that His love was great and His love was sure, and his love was not dictated by condition. I want you to understand today that that same thing applies to you and I today through Jesus Christ the Lord, that his love is, doesn't have condition upon you and I. It is an unconditional love. <clears throat> he loves us when we're good. He loves us when we're not good. He loves us when our spirit's high. He loves us when our spirit's low. He loves us on the mountaintop. He loves us in the valley. No matter where we are, the love of Jesus Christ for you and I is sure. Amen. And we can count on it. And we can know that it's there. I make mistakes just like you and you do. And, and, and I have my failures just like you do. But the love of God is consistent. 
amen, that he loves me back to a right place, right? That he loves me back to a place in communion with him and closeness with him. But one of the things we want to look at today is the feast of the first fruits. And the feast of the first fruits was just the beginning of the barley harvest. And that would come somewhere in that day and time. That would come somewhere in what we would call April, last of March, April. It would coincide with what we would call Easter season. The the resurrection, the death and the burial of the resurrection of Jesus Christ the Lord. It would coincide with that very thing. And so now they're celebrating the spring harvest. It has been sown in the winter and it has grown and it has come and it has made its uh, portion. And now here it's to be harvested and brought in. And there's a celebration of that for the provisions of God. Can I talk to you this morning just a moment that when Jesus was sown into the earth, it was three days later that he rose again and produced the harvest of first fruits. The first fruits of the work of Jesus Christ after his death was his resurrection. Amen. And we experience the power of his resurrection as he allows us to pass from death unto life. What are you talking about? I was dead in the trespasses of sin, but by the grace and mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ, he saved me. And that is the workings of the first fruits of Christ. That is the workings uh, of the feast of the first fruits. Amen. That he did a work in my life. He did a work in your life. Amen. That there was a harvest to bring in and we sprung from death to life. We know a seed has to be planted. A seed has to die before it can live. I want you to understand that this seed of Christ that has been planted in our heart is ever growing. It is ever producing fruit. It is ever doing the work and the will of the Lord in our hearts and our lives. Amen. And we produce a godly fruit. If we're not producing a godly fruit, then we are not of God. I want you to understand a child of God does not produce rotten fruit. A child of God does not produce damaged fruit. A child of God produces the fruit that has been cared for and taken care of by the Lord Jesus Christ because we've submitted our wills and ourselves unto him. We put forth a precious fruit is what the Bible says because this is a fruit, amen, that has been administered by the gifts of the Spirit of God. Amen? And so when we begin to look at this, these these gifts of the or celebration of the first fruits, it is to you and I to understand that we're always to celebrate our salvation. We are always to celebrate our resurrection from the dead. Amen. It wasn't physical. It was spiritual. A carnal man died. Amen. But a spiritual man was uh, called to rise up in his place. I died to the trespasses of sin and I rose into the righteousness of God. That, amen, constitutes that I'm not a sinner anymore, but I am a child of God. Amen. I am the first fruits of Jesus Christ the Lord. You are the first fruits of Jesus Christ the Lord. I submit to you today, we should never, amen, rue the day when we were born again. But always we should thank God that we had the opportunity to rise up at the call and command of Jesus Christ the Lord from the the trespasses of sin, from the darkness of sin, from the gutters of life, amen, and be established in the highways of the holiness of God. I look to you today and say, what a work that the Lord did. What a celebration it ought to be. Uh, I know we get downtrodden sometime, but oh, what a wonderful reminder, amen, of what the Lord has done in my life. I'm redeemed by grace divine. Glory, glory, Christ is mine. All to him I now resign. I have been redeemed because of the first fruits uh, of Jesus Christ the Lord. Then we look and understand that they came along 50 days later and there were a couple more celebrations in between these two. 
Passover being one of them, but now they come and what we'd be celebrating now would be the Feast of Weeks or the Feast of Pentecost. And so they were celebrating now in the, in the day, the old day, the Feast of Pentecost was the celebration of the beginning of the wheat harvest. And so they've got the barley in and now it's the celebration of the wheat harvest and they are going out to glean the fields of the crops that they have produced. Uh, I want you to understand now, amen, at this feast uh, of Pentecost, uh, we begin to look forward and move forward just a little bit. Joel prophesied in chapter 2 that in the last days the Lord would pour out His Spirit. I want you to understand that the last days began at the outpouring of the Spirit in Jerusalem. The original day, amen, of the pouring out of the Holy Ghost of God as Jesus had told them after his resurrection from the grave, go to Jerusalem and tarry till you be endued with power from on high. You remember, amen, that there the last ten days were the great days, amen, that the people prayed, but they endued, they endured, they prayed, they were steadfast. Five hundred went to the room and began to pray, but 380 found something else to do. But there were 120 that were intrigued enough to know, I want to know what the comforter is. I want to know what the Holy Ghost is. I want to know what this power is that Jesus said I could have. And the Bible says that on the day of Pentecost, uh, amen, that they were in the upper room, uh, one mind, one accord, one place. Uh, and as they were praying, uh, amen, the Bible says that the wind began to blow, uh, amen, and filled the room where they were sitting with cloven tongues of fire that rested upon each of them. And they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Uh, it was so power, powerful that Peter went out on the street street. Amen. Began to preach the gospel. Amen. To people of different dialects. Uh, but the Holy Ghost had come. Amen. There was an understanding uh, in the street. Uh, amen. Then I can only guess that Peter was preaching. Yeah. They killed my Lord, but he rose again. Uh, and this is that which he promised. Uh, they thought they'd done away with him. Uh, they tried to stomp the fire out, uh, but all they did is make a fire spread. Uh, I've got a Pentecostal fire in my soul, and I've come to preach Jesus to you today on the streets of Jerusalem, that he is alive, that he is sitting at the right hand of the Father, and that he is imparting his power unto them that love him. I submit to you today that the Holy Ghost moved through that congregation of unbelievers, and 3,000 souls were rescued because of the power power of the Holy Ghost. And we continue to read the exploits of the Holy Ghost, the celebration of Pentecost, the celebration of the fire falling. And as I've read to you this morning, that Jesus began to talk, amen, about, amen, this Holy Ghost. And he started off this way, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. You want to know what the qualification of the Spirit is? The qualification of being Spirit-filled is that you love Jesus Christ and keep His commandments. Amen? What must I do to be filled with the Holy Ghost? Well, Jesus told you. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And then what did He say? I will pray the Father. Amen. And he shall give you another comforter. And so they go hand in hand. They're bound together. Amen. By gospel cords. You cannot. Amen. Abhor the things of God and have the spirit of Christ. You and I must love him to the fullness of our capacity. I want you to know this today. Amen. There's a lot of times in people a man question or the enemy may question you. How do you know you love God? How, how do you know God loves you? Well, how am I going to prove myself to the Lord Jesus Christ? You know how I'm going to prove myself to Jesus? I'm going to keep his commandments. Amen? This ain't rocket science, folks. 
Hey, man, I'm going to keep his commandments. I'm going to do his will. I'm going to follow in his path. I'm going to call it quits, amen, to those things that interfere, amen, with the moving and the working of the Spirit in my life. I'm going to forsake sin. I'm going to forsake my own self. And I'm going to cleave to Jesus Christ, the Lord. You want to prove your love for Jesus? Keep his word. I look to you today, and I want you to understand this also, that Jesus said it's the spirit of truth, a man whom the world cannot receive. You know who the world is? The world represented here are those that are filled with the pride of life, the lust of the eye, and the lust of the flesh. Those that are filled with the spirit of carnality. Can I tell you there's a lot of carnality in the church today? Can I tell you that there's a lot of carnality in the workings and the movements of, the, of people that profess to be sons and daughters of God? But Jesus designated that there were two types of people, the lost and the unsaved. Amen? He didn't say that there's a third category, a gray area, but he said, amen, we were either born again or we're not. We either understand or we don't. We either know him or we don't. But we cannot allow ourselves to yield to the spirit of carnality and speck to be that glistening child of God, that lust of the eye, that lust of the flesh, that pride of life. Hey, man, the Bible talks to us in the book of John in chapter 2 and 16 uh, and tells us about those very things. Uh, hey, man, that they are detrimental to the walk of anybody that's trying to follow Jesus Christ. What are you saying? If you love the things of the flesh more than you love the things of God you are carnal if you can't give up on sin you're carnal and you know not the spirit that's not my words they're written right here in red I want you to understand today folks Amen, that this gospel way is a holy way. It's not a denominational way. It's a holy way. It is the way that Jesus Christ prescribed to you and I. Amen. How many of you in here take medicine? Go ahead and raise your hand and let the Lord love you. You take medicine. Huh? Do you take that medicine, amen, consistently as prescribed? Right? It tells you to take it twice a day. You take it twice a day. And you don't question it. You just do it because it's supposed to be for your health. Do you worry about the side effects of that medicine you're taking? Because I want you to understand that every medicine that we take has a side effect. It has some kind of action against our body. It might be trying to help one thing, but it's causing a problem somewhere else. And that's why you have to take this pill to counteract that pill and that pill to counteract that pill. I've seen people take handfuls of pill. I take plenty myself. But what I want you to understand is we take them because we trust the doctor. What's wrong with taking the gospel pill? What's wrong with taking the antidote, amen, that the Lord has given us, amen, that kills the infection, the infirmity of sin in your life? Amen? Amen. And there's no bad side effects, amen, for this antidote that the Lord's given us. Amen. For this penicillin of salvation, this penicillin of purity, amen, that the Lord has given us. There's no bad side effects. Uh, it only affects the devil. Amen. Because it makes the enemy mad. It makes the enemy want to fight. It makes the enemy want to destroy. Amen. But what I'm telling you, uh, this antidote, amen, that the Lord has given us, uh, it empowers the working of the blood of Jesus Christ in our lives uh, to keep us holy, to keep us pure. I'm not kept pure by my own volition. I'm kept pure by the will of Jesus Christ the Lord. I'm kept pure by the mannerisms of the Lord Jesus Christ in my life. Only because I've submitted unto him and I follow him where he leads. So what are you saying, preacher? I'm saying that when we, 
amen, are born again and we forsake carnality, we're forsaking the cusser. We're forsaking the alcohol. We're forsaking the illicit drugs. We're forsaking, uh, amen, the fevers uh, of carnality, amen, and we're uh, uh, selling out, amen, to the wholesomeness of what the Spirit of God is in our life. Jesus is not going to drive you to the nightclub He's going to drive you to the altar. He's going to drive you, amen, to the high places. Uh, he's going to drive you to those places, uh, amen, that you can be a light in a dark alley. Amen. You can be a light to them that have never seen uh, the power of God. Uh, I sinned with all my might. May God help me to serve him with all my might. Amen. Amen. And so Jesus is telling us that the world cannot receive the spirit of truth because it doesn't see him nor know him. But then he said, but. Boy, when Jesus says but, it's big. But. I'm talking to you that have been born again. I'm talking to you amen, that have climbed on this glory train. He said, but you know him. Well, how do I know him? Because he dwells in me. Jesus said, you know him because he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. He's with me. And so when I think about the contrast between what Jesus said, he is with me and he is in me, I know that he has built a throne in my heart and he abides in the kingdom of my heart. But when he is with me, that means he is about me. Amen? I'm all about some Jesus, but I'm going to tell you something. It means a whole lot more when Jesus said, I'm all about you. That means he's around me. He's my hedge. He's my covering. He's my solid rock. He is my everything. When Jesus says, I'm right there, it means, son, you ain't taking a step. Hey, man, that I ain't already checked where your foot's going to land. Y'all get that after a while and shout about it. Because what's happening is, is that the Lord's not going to allow me to walk in quicksand. But I'm going to walk in the solid places. What does it mean? It means I can walk through the valley of shadow of death and not worry about death. Not worry about evil. Not be scared of what's going to happen to me. It means I can walk through there with my head lifted up. Amen. Look into Jesus Christ the Lord and be completely amiss of the things that are going on around me. I want to talk about the power of the Holy Ghost. Who's keeping you? The power of the Holy Ghost. I want you to understand, folks, that the things that the Lord fights off of you and I that we don't even know about, the battles that he wins for you and I that we never face, those that the enemy sends our way but they don't never get here because a comforter said no. I imagine we don't even fight 1% of the trials that the enemy throws our way. Because we have the comforter. Do you understand the importance today of walking in the spirit of Jesus Christ the Lord? Do you understand today the importance of forsaking, uh, amen, the carnal desires that Satan puts in front of us? Sin always paints itself as a beautiful thing. 
sin always paints itself as something that is delightful. It's fun. We're going to have a good time. We're going to laugh. And we're just going to embellish ourselves in anything we desire to do. But sin never paints the end of the book. They'll write the, it'll write those first few chapters of all that it has to offer you, but the book's never finished because it doesn't want you to know the outcome. And you know the outcome of sin is death. The outcome of sin is misery. The devil looks at you and says, God don't love you. Oh, really? Well, he's done more for me than you have. He's done more to help me than you have. He's done more to encourage me than you have. All you've ever told me is how dirty and sorry and rotten everything is. And the Lord has given me eyes to see how good and pleasant it is to dwell. Amen. In the presence of the Almighty. All you try to do is discourage me, devil. But I hear... The voice of the Lord that says, just hold on. It's going to get better. It's going to get better. Hold on. It's going to be all right. If you'll just trust me. And there's the rub. It's hard for us to trust. Just as what Jesus said about the world that knows not the Spirit, He said they know Him not because they don't see Him. Because they don't trust Him. Because they don't have faith to understand that even though he's unseen by the physical eye, he's very present to the spiritual heart. The Holy Ghost. And so Jesus tells his disciples about this. I'm going to go away, but when I send you this Holy Ghost, he's going to be your teacher. And he's going to bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I've said. Now a lot of times people have used that scripture and the other ones later on in the Bible that we don't have to study the word of God. The Lord will give it to us when we need it. No. The Lord has called us to study his word. The Lord has called us to pack that word in our heart. You got a supercomputer right here. You got a more powerful computer that can process greater amounts of information than any computer that man has ever made. It does it faster, it does it better, and it does it accurately. God programmed this one. And so what the Lord is saying that if we put the word of God in our hearts, it's going to translate to our database. I do know some times, Brother Jason. I mean, I don't know a bunch. I know just enough to get me in trouble. My way of fixing a computer is turning it off, unplugging it, and let it reboot, and let's do it again. And if it don't come back on, send it to somebody that can get it on. But I got a supercomputer right here. Amen, because the Spirit of God dwells in me, he reboots my computer. When the enemy comes in like a flood and tries to overwhelm me, he reboots, he reboots his computer right here. Amen. And that word that I've put in the database comes and begins to deliver me because that word is powerful. Amen. Amen. Because the Lord in this situation that I'm in the Lord is bringing the word of deliverance to my mind. And when it comes to my mind, it's coming to my heart. And when it comes to my heart, it's coming to my situation. And when it comes to my situation, it's coming to my praise. Because I'm going to praise my way out of it. Amen. Because the Lord has given me the power through the Holy Ghost to overcome. And so he said, he's your teacher. I told you I was going to hit several different things this morning. Ain't no way just to stay on one thing. There's just too much. 
And so Jesus said, I'll, it'll be your teacher. And it'll be your leader. And it'll be your thinker. And it'll be your director. And it'll be your advocate. It'll be everything that you need it to be if you'll just surrender to it. If you'll love me. And you'll keep my commandments. And then we get to the book of Acts. Jesus has died. He's done all these different things that he's done. We get to the book of Acts in chapter 1 and verse 8. And then what does the writer tell us? But. First word of verse 8. But. You shall receive what? Power. After what? The Holy Ghost has come upon you. And the, one of the main purposes, one of the main functions of the Holy Ghost, he said it next. And you shall be witnesses. And he listed the cities that they'd all kicked him out of. He said, I'm going to send you right back where they didn't want me and you're going to tell them about me and this power is going to blow their minds. What was he saying? I'm going to send you right back to the devil's lap. Amen. And we're going to deliver some people by and through the power of the Holy Ghost, the witness that you have of what I've done in your life. The witness of the Holy Ghost is not what he's done for somebody else. It's what he's done for you. I can't tell nobody else's testimony as effectively as they can, but I can tell my own. I know what the Lord has done in my life. And so he said, we're going to receive power to be his witnesses. Well, what is my witness? My witness is my character. My witness is my walk. My witness is my integrity. My witness is my faith. My witness is my makeup in the spirit. We talk about our genetic makeup. Amy will tell me, she'll say, you look like your mama more and more every day. That's fine. I was partial to my mama. I like my mama. I said that to somebody the other day, and they said, they say I look a lot like my mama, and I act like my mama. And he looked at me and said, boy, hold your head high. He said, your mama was a good woman. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's a good compliment. That's a great compliment. But I want to compliment Jesus. I want to compliment the Spirit. It's all right and okay to say you just like such and such, but listen, my goal is to be like Jesus. I want His attributes. I want His character. If I'm satisfied with acting like a man, another man, then I'm not going to help anybody because man's flawed. Man is full of a malady of error. But Jesus is complete. So therefore, if I'm going to emulate anybody, I want to emulate Jesus. And Sister Sandra, catch this. He said, if I'll be like him, he'll give me the spirit. He'll give me the power of the Holy Ghost if I'll be like him. Ain't nobody ever been able to give me nothing like that. Ain't nobody ever been giving me the power, amen, that if I can get to a place with Jesus, I can lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. That I can pray for people and lead them to salvation. That I can pray for people and they be delivered from demonic spirits. That they, they be delivered from life. Altering circumstances in their life. Delivered from the chains of drugs. 
And we can do all these things through the Spirit of God if we do what? Keep His commandments. Do you understand the importance of what Jesus said? He started this whole dialogue. Getting into the Spirit, this whole dialogue with the qualification that if you're going to move and work effectively in the Holy Ghost, you've got to keep His commandments. We got to be obedient to the spirit of truth. Not what we've been brought up in. The spirit of truth. The word of God. I want you to know today that our traditions have limited the power of God in our life. I'll say it one more time because I'm convinced of it. That our traditions have limited the power of God in our life. Because we've relegated God to a specific place in our life that He can't do but what our thoughts allow Him to do. But God's bigger than your thought process. God's bigger than your computing power. God's bigger than your reasoning power. God's bigger than our understanding. And I'm just going to drop a little something on you here. If God can use a donkey to save a man's life, don't you think He can use people that we don't think is worthy? Just because they don't meet your litmus test don't mean they don't meet Jesus. I'm just speaking the truth to you. That donkey wasn't saved. That donkey won't born again. That donkey... There was never a sacrifice made for that donkey. But the Spirit of the Lord came upon him and said, Balaam, you big dummy. I'm trying to help you here. And you're doing your best to die. And I'm trying to help you live. There's a message there. There's a message there. Jesus said, keep his commandments. Not the commandments of our forefathers. The commandments of Christ. I'm not worried about sinning if I keep the commandments of Christ. I'm not worried about what somebody's going to say if I keep the commandments of Christ. I want no part of the fear of man. I want no part of being intimidated by somebody because I ain't doing it their way. Ain't but one that died for me and rose again, and that's Jesus. And what I figured out, they didn't like Jesus. What makes me think they're going to like me? What I'm saying to you is that it doesn't matter where you go, somebody will find fault with your life. So why are you going to worry about what they think? Just focus on Jesus. Just live a good, pure, holy life before Jesus. And let Jesus love you. And walk in the light of His love. And as long as Jesus is happy, <laughs> there ain't none of them going to be sitting on your jury. But Brother David, I want people to like me. At what expense? At what expense? There are people that ain't going to like you just because you breathe in their air. Look, it, it's just time to be real folks. You know, we won't walk around in a bubble. But it's time to bust the bubble and get real for Jesus Christ the Lord. And just allow the Spirit of God to work through us. Let God do what He wants to do. You know, God, the Spirit, is not going to make a mockery of itself. The Spirit is not going to get you to sin to do good. <laughs> you know, I hear the adages of the world where some, well, sometimes you just got to lie to people, you know, to give them peace. I've never known peace to be in a lie. 
I've never known hope to reside in a lie. But I have known this, that the truth will make you free. And Jesus Christ is that truth. And so we've made it to Acts chapter 2 now. The Holy Ghost is falling. People are getting saved. And I want to finish up at the end of Acts chapter 2. Because this is where we need to be. This is what we need to understand. At the end of Acts chapter 2. Oh, we'll just go and let's go, let's go look at it. Just so we can get it right. It won't take me no more than an hour to do this. And there that is. Look. As Peter got through pre preaching, in verse 41, look. He said, they gladly received his word. This is the power of the Spirit. That they gladly received his word and were baptized. And there were about 3,000 souls that day. And listen, they continued steadfastly. They were consistent. They went on and they were consistent in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and breaking in bread and praying. What does it mean? It means there was unity there. There was a camaraderie there in the Spirit of God that they enjoyed being around one another because of what the Spirit of the Lord was doing. In the house of God, if we're where the Spirit wants us to be, we should enjoy the fellowship of one another in the house of God. And it said fear came upon every soul, a godly fear. It was a respect, a healthy respect. And wonders and signs were done. And all that believed were together and had all things common. Look, they sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men. As every man, every man had need. And they continued daily with one accord in the temple. Breaking bread from house to house. And, and did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily as such as be saved. And so that is the absolute working of the Spirit of God. When the Spirit of God is working like it's designed to work, what does it say? The Lord adds to the church daily as such should be saved. Now you understand why the devil wants to keep division in the church. Now you understand why the devil devil always is trying to put enmity in your heart towards somebody because if he's got you focused on the wrong things then you're not going to enjoy the blessings of the spirit of God it, division and enmity have no place in the house of God we hadn't jumped up and down today but I've preached to you I've preached to you the truth of God's word this morning. About the moving, the working, the implementation of the Holy Ghost today. And when the Holy Ghost is implemented right, it works right. It'll take the sourness out of you. It'll take the bitterness out of you. It'll take the ugliness out of you. And it'll replace it with goodness, mercy, and grace. A lot of times, most times, just about every time, it'll take the complainer out of you. The whiner. Amen? Brother David, I don't complain. Okay. That's your story. I'll let you have it. I don't complain. Okay. The Spirit of God when working correctly in our life gives us a joy that overcomes. You hear me? That's the finality of it. It gives us a joy that overcomes. That's why the Bible says we are overcomers. More than conquerors. Jesus didn't make us a survivor. There's a difference between a survivor and an overcomer. He made us overcome. Are you an overcomer today? The Spirit of God makes us overcomers. Let's all stand.
on this day we celebrate what Jesus gave us to completely give us a full armament of warfare, spiritual warfare. That's what the Spirit represents, a full armament of warfare to resist the enemy. Let's allow the Lord to teach us how to be those good soldiers of the cross. How to be those that we can use it effectively. Not to kill one another. But to encourage one another. To overcome, to defeat the enemy. That others might be saved. Jesus needs a church that is committed to him. Jesus needs a church, amen, that is ready to keep his commandments. And see the power of God. The altars are open this morning.